WFR. Truth Frequency Radio. Howard is asked, the question, is it safe? Expediency asks, the question, is it politic? Vanity asks, the question, is it popular? But conscience asks, the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. Every time our country stands in the path of danger, an instinct seems to summon her finest first, those who truly understand her. When freedom shivers in the cold shadow of true peril, it's always the patriots who first hear the call. When loss of liberty is looming as it is now, the siren sounds first in the hearts of freedom's vanguard. Fighting for humanity and against globalism, one mind at a time. It's the Freedom Link with Joe Joseph. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Freedom Link, this 15th of July 2014. I'm Joe Joseph, and man, do I have a great broadcast for you tonight, because tonight my guest is Rob Skiba. Now, he's an award-winning documentary filmmaker and the best-selling author of several books, including Babylon Rising and The First Shall Be Last, and also Archon Invasion, The Rise, Fall, and Return of the Nephilim. This is extremely, extremely uh, just earth-shattering information to anybody out there that um, writes off the Bible as being this deceptive instrument, and it also uh, gives a new twist on history. He's been an actor since the founding of his high school drama club in 1986. He's a renowned speaker all over the world. Having a, he's appeared in numerous theatrical presentations across the country. Uh, he's a graduate of the Hollywood Film Institute, and his lifelong dream has been to produce a powerful television and motion picture. Uh, and that's awesome because he's working full time on the development and production of Seed, a uh, television series. And with uh, with that said, I don't want to waste much more time on this. I want to welcome Rob to the broadcast. Rob Skiba, welcome to the Freedom Link. Hey, Joe. Thanks for, so much for having me. Oh man, the pleasure is all mine. I got to tell you, I've been. I've been um, doing a lot of research into this, um, uh, looking into the works of like uh, Tom Horn, L.A. Marzulli, and yeah, and uh, you know, then then I, you know, going through YouTube, there you are on the side. I recommend. I'm like, hey, I'll go check this out, and I was like, oh, the Liger, dang, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you thought it was just in Napoleon Dynamite too, huh? Good God, no! I mean, it was awesome, <laughs> but uh, but uh, you know, uh, funny, uh, we we. Uh, we first uh hooked up and on facebook and found out that we grew up together and never knew each other <laughs> crazy crazy small world what you a grew small up in world. Uh, springfield massachusetts i grew up in chicopee just down the street yeah i mean unbelievable like 20 minutes away and yeah. uh, just never knew it funny how uh how, how god works in our lives and and how he brings people together especially people of kindred spirits to come together and talk about these very important issues. And, and the reason why I brought you on um, the broadcast is to talk about the, uh, the Nephilim and, uh, you know, some of the mythology uh, that's out there, like uh, the, the Anunnaki, you know, the Sumerian um, mythology and all that. And I guess the best way to start out is to use a Bible reference, as far as I know, and that would be Genesis 6. And Genesis six, um, it's like it's it's the only reference that I found in Genesis of of these of these giants. And basically, what it says, Genesis six says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. And uh, 6 4, Genesis 6 4 says, There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. 
when the sons of God came to the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. What does that mean, Rob? Well, you know, that's a great question. And it's something that as a kid, I always wondered about, you know, um, you know, what kid doesn't like stories of giants, right? Oh, right. And, you know, we, we, you know, we have the Jack and the Beanstalk and all the little fairy tales and stuff, but you know, there's all kinds of other, you know, tales of the gods and you know, clash of the Titans and, you know, all that stuff. Of course, there's a lot more of it these days, uh, you know, in the movie theaters and whatnot. And I was wondering about it. What's the deal with this stuff, you know? And, uh, you know, I read the same passage that you read, and I'm like, in, depending on the English translation you read, uh, the word Nephilim is there. And, you know, some translations just put giant, but either way, it catches, you know, a young person's attention. You're like, giants, what? Yeah. Right here in the Bible? Um, but when, you know, the, the King James uses giants, but other translations just use the, the, the native Hebrew word Nephilim. And so I've always been intrigued by that and wanted to figure out what the deal was. And I actually had to back up a little bit further uh, to really get the context of what's going on in Genesis 6, backing off to Genesis 3, where you have the first prophecy in the Bible. And it's where, you know, Adam and Eve have just taken of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know, and God's upset and he's talking in the serpents right there. And it says, uh, you know, the woman says, the serpent deceived me and I ate, you know. And so the Lord says to the serpent, well, because you've done this, you know, you're going to be cursed on your belly and all that. But he says, I'm going to put uh, enmity between your seed and the seed of the woman. And he, the first prophecy is God telling the devil or the serpent that Eve's seed is going to crush the devil's head. Well, I mean, if you're the one receiving that prophecy, you know, her seed's going to crush your head. I mean, that's a bad thing, right? That's a so, bad thing. That's a bad thing. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to mess up her seed. You know, <laughs> it's yeah, really strategic. It, I mean, I have to say, I, I never looked at it from the the uh, you know the move counter move move counter. It, it's yeah. it, the tactics uh, that are employed here are just phenomenal. I mean, I can, I've never seen the Bible in this way before. Yeah, L.A. Marzulli is another researcher, and he's kind of coined the phrase the cosmic chess match. But uh, I had a very similar concept of the move and counter move. I didn't, I didn't have the foresight to coin that cool phrase, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's true. You, you see it all over the Bible. There's a move and counter move, move and counter move, and and you see it right there. Here's okay. God makes a move. Says okay, her seed's gonna crush your head. So Deborah says okay, I gotta make my move now. I'm gonna mess up her seed, and so he gets Cain to kill Abel. You know, right. Um, you know, and obviously, if you, you look at the account of Cain and Abel, you know, one had a predisposition to listening to the voice of truth and one had a predisposition to listen to the listening to the enemy. So the bad one uh, kills the good one. OK. And then, of course, you know, the deal Cain gets a mark on his head. and He's kind of cast out. Um, and then Adam and Eve have another child, Seth. And, you know, I, I look at this and think, OK, you know, if you had two kids and one of them kills the other and then takes off, and then you have another kid, do you think you might be a little protective of that next child? Well, of course. <laughs> You're going to be very protective of that sure. next child. So I don't think Cain or anybody else was able to get to Seth. So then you have what I consider to be probably plan B, and I call it the Genesis 6 experiment, where you, you get this kind of this new plan to jack up the seed. And this is where a platoon, I would say, of 200 watcher class angels now we know that there are different classes of angels you got archangels and seraphim and cherubim you know and stuff like that they're different guardian angels and stuff we read about well watcher is a class of angel that is actually in the canonized text of the book of daniel but in the book of enoch we learn which is not in our bible today it's been in and out of the canon in various times in history and various cultures ethiopians still have it in their bible to this day but Regardless of whether it should or should not be considered canon, it was a book that was wide read, widely read and understood by the people in the Bible. In fact, Jude quotes from it directly. So, And that's one of those other things that, as a young person growing up and reading the scriptures, always intrigued me, is whenever the Bible mentions books that are not in the Bible. Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, well, where are those books, you know? Yeah, and of course, uh, I think you're, you're talking about the book of Enoch, Jasher, Jubilees. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and and others. I mean, there right. there's something like twenty books, if I remember right. Uh, I counted them up at one time. I forget what the number was, but yeah, you know, there's quite a number of them that aren't in the current canon. So I'm like, well, you know, I've always been intrigued by that. 
and Enoch in particular, because it's, it, when Moses is writing the Torah and the book of Genesis, he throws this word out, Nephilim, without any further explanation, which presupposes two things. A, he knew what he was talking about, and B, so did his audience, because he felt no need to elaborate on it. So, you know, you're six chapters into the first book of the Bible, and he throws a word out with no further explanation. I'm like, well, where did he get that from? Exactly. You know, I mean, I, I get it that he spoke with God on a mountain. So, I mean, you got, you, I give you that, but he didn't explain it to the people, you know? No, absolutely. So, that they didn't go on the mountain with with Moses. So where did how did they know what he was talking about? And if anybody's ever read the Book of Enoch, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about because that's a it's a pretty wild book, um, just just slam packed with information specifically related to what I call the Genesis six experiment, and that was is where we get the details of 200 Watcher class angels coming down in the days of Jared, Noah's great, great, great grandfather. I think I always forget how many generations before, but you know, several generations before Noah, um, and they land on Mount Hermon in the days of Jared. Mm -hmm. And that's where they get busy. They, they mate with women and they produce Nephilim. And so that when you read the book of Enoch, you find out, okay, Nephilim is the direct descendant of an angel. It's an angel human hybrid. It's a descendant of an angel who had mated with women. You get Nephilim. And the Book of Enoch says these things got just unimaginably huge. I mean, these things were just ridiculously huge. And Enoch call, says that there were 3,000 L's, and Dr. A. Nyland's one of the translators of the Book of Enoch uh, into English. Uh, this person has a volume of the Book of Enoch in English, translated that uh, as 300 cubits. Now, what I find interesting about that number is that's the same height as the length of the ark. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. Yards. That's a big, that's a big dude. Let me tell you. That's a big dude. That translates to 450 feet. Now, now look, I didn't write it. I'm just telling you what it says. Uh, we have a hard time wrapping our head around a 450 foot tall dude. Right. But you know what? The Greeks didn't. They had no problem with it at all. They called them the Titans. In right. In fact, if you've watched the last two Clash of the Titan movies, they basically depict it that way. Same thing in Percy Jackson and the light, not, not the Lightning Thief, but the second one that just came out. Um, in both cases, they show the Titan uh, is just ridiculously huge. So I'm like, well, you know, what if, you know, this got me thinking early on. I'm like, what if there's some truth to these early myths, you know, the, the Egyptian myths, the Sumerian myths, the, the Greek myths, Roman myths, what, you know, what, what if it's all based on truth? And I, I have a friend of mine who grew up in Greece, uh, was born there, was raised there, speaks Greek fluently. And I was talking to him about some of my theories regarding Greek mythology, just to get his take on it. And he said, you know, Rob, you keep referring to it as mythology, but it, when I grew up in school, they didn't teach it to us as myth. They taught us to us as fact, as history. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And this, you know, a contemporary friend of mine who's the same age as you, if you and I, who grew up in Greece, and he's like, yeah, you know, we were taught this as fact, as 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 part of our history. And there's another guy named King Wells who uh, lives not too far from me here in Texas, who wrote a book, Ancient Myths in the Bible, and he, in his book, suggests that we should take the Bible. Uh, and we should view the Bible from a mythological worldview. Yeah. Now, on the surface, that sounds kind of odd if you grow up with a Christian worldview, because we're taught that we should look at everything from a biblical worldview. And he's not disputing that. But what he's saying is, when you realize that the authors of Scripture were writing at a time when the Sumerian myths, the Babylonian myths, the Egyptian myths, the Greek myths, the Roman myths were all very real to those people. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, As a matter of fact, let me let me interject this, you know— um, uh, one of the one of the pivotal people that that um, got me into this and broke me away from the idea that you know, like for example, the dinosaurs. Oh yes, they were extinct millions of years ago, and everything yeah. like that. Well, Dr. Ken Hoven, um, yeah. He, yeah, he, yeah, yeah, he pops on from time to time. I get to I get the uh, luxury of being able to call him um, up uh, in New Hampshire, and. Um, and I'll play some of the conversations that we have. And it's very interesting because he, uh, based on his research, man walked with the dinosaurs. As a matter of fact, That's right. if you look at dinosaur prints, you'll see human footprints inside the dinosaur prints. You know, yeah. so that's really what kind of got me going down that road. But this here, 
puts the Bible in a whole new context. It actually becomes so exciting and so alive when you put it in that mythological context, like you were saying, that it just, I don't know, I, I am just absolutely, I, I'm invigorated to actually get in there and study it more because it shows, it, it like brings together all these different mythologies and it looks like they all spawn from the same place. They really do. And it's funny you mentioned Kent Hovind. He, uh, interestingly enough, you know, you, you grew up in Springfield. I grew up in Chicopee. Yeah. Uh, I went to Tabernacle Baptist Church on New Ludlow Road in Chicopee. And Kent Hovind uh, uh, came there and did his creation series um, for like a week at, at, our, at my church. And I bought like all 12 of his VHS <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, tapes on creation. And I actually dubbed them to audio cassette and would listen to them in my car. Um, because he was so, he really opened my mind. To, I never bought evolution. Um, when I was a kid uh, in fifth grade is when I remember them first really starting to push it on me. And I, I raised my hand as a fifth grader and I said, uh, well, if we came from monkeys, how come they're still monkeys? And it was a sincere <laughs> question. I didn't, I, you know, I, I'd never heard this before, but that was a sincere question I had. And the teacher couldn't answer it to my satisfaction and asked again in sixth grade, seventh grade, kept going. And then between eighth and ninth grade, we had summer vacation, you know, and get in there freshman year of high school. I thought, okay, you know, I'm back in class again. They're, te- they're pushing this stuff on me again. I'm going to ask it the same question. And, but they stopped saying the theory of evolution and started teaching it just as evolution, as if it was a fact. And I was, I was kind of excited because I was like, wow, you guys proved a lot over summer vacation. So maybe you can answer a question. I've been, bother- it's been bothering me since fifth grade. And they still couldn't. And it was right around that time that Ken Hovind came through town and gave me a real solid defense uh, against the propaganda that they were feeding us in public school. And so I, that's why I listened to it so much, because I wanted to have the answers, you know. And I would challenge the teacher like every year science class. I was challenging everything. And, of course, to pass the test, you got to answer what the textbook says. But so if they say, well, how old is the Earth? I would say, according to the textbook, 4.6 billion years, despite the fact that and I would give a whole bunch of apologetics. It's proved that that can't be, <laughs> you know, so I still got the answer right. and I still graduated, but annoyed the heck out of the teachers, you know. Absolutely. And, I actually wrote to him, uh, Kent Hovind, not too long ago uh, and dedicated my my books to him because he was a huge influence in my life at an early age, uh, getting me to think critically and to research these things. And, you know, it really did start with dinosaurs. And now that I'm here in Texas, I can go to the Paluxy River, bend down there. You can see the human footprints inside the dinosaur footprints and all the stuff that he used to talk about. Sure. And. But, you know, I mean, this kind of study of the book of Genesis, you, you can't avoid the Nephilim. Right. Now, you know, Kent, I think, is starting to uh, delve into that a little bit more than he had in the past. He never really talked about that kind of stuff, you know, in the early years anyway. Um, but for me, it, I mean, it all dovetails together. I mean, it's all intertwined. And even animal-human hybrids. Um, I, I was a missionary for six and a half years, traveled to over a dozen countries. And uh, during my travels, I, I had the opportunity to go to Athens twice, and, uh, and I went to Cyprus, uh, one of these trips. And, and you know, everywhere you look in the Greek Isles and, and in Greece, you can't look anywhere without seeing the toppled remains of a statue of a god or a temple or some sort of depiction of a satyr or a minotaur, you know, or a centaur, right. you know, these these animal human hybrids. And, and then on my second trip to Athens, I, I was, it was really impressed upon me. That man, this stuff is still very, you know, very much in the collective consciousness of these people. And you know, I'm a sci-fi fan. I love Star Wars and all that stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, man, four thousand years from now, nobody's going to remember Yoda. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, you know, George Lucas, you know, who was like my childhood hero growing up. I mean, I had everything Star Wars. You know, uh, and watched all the making of and all that stuff. And in one of the documentaries he made the statement that he was trying to cr- invent a modern mythology and so just like homer who is the author of the odyssey and iliad and where we get most of our greek mythology from um you know if if george is just like homer nobody's gonna remember yoda four thousand years from now you know what i mean but yet everybody right. still remembers the stuff that homer wrote about and, and in fact it's required reading even in our american english classes you know we have to read the odyssey and the iliad and the greek myths so I, I came back from that trip and i told my wife i said you know all those 
animal human hybrids in mythology? She said, yeah. I said, I think they were real. You know, I mean, why would they still be talking about this stuff and still be thinking about this stuff, you know? And, you know, we had an interesting talk, went to bed. The next morning, we wake up, and she goes in the other room and checks her email, and there was a BBC news feed that, that came in that she saw, and she clicked on it, and it and the article was, scientists had successfully cloned a sheep with a human heart. And the article went on to say that if they keep doing this, eventually the genes are going to fuse together, and we're going to end up with animal-human hybrids. And I'm like, whoa! I mean, it was literally the next morning after I just postulated the idea that maybe there was some truth to this stuff. And what intrigued me about that is there's a prophecy that Yeshua or Jesus Mm -hmm. said in Matthew 24, 37. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. In other words, the second coming that Christians are looking for in the last days are going to be like the days of Noah. And so I'm going, well, that begs the question, what differentiates the days of Noah from any other time in human history? Because the rest of Matthew 24 you know, the disciples had asked him, what's it going to be like? What are the signs of the times, you know, when you're going to come back? And he gives them a whole bunch of signs, you know, wars, rumors of war, pestilence, famine, earthquakes, all that. Well, but we've had all of those things f- forever, right. you know? So what's different about the days of Noah? You know, if we've always had earthquakes and pestilence and wars, what's the difference? Well, that forced me to look at the days of Noah a lot closer. Most people, you hear Noah and your mind goes, Noah's Ark. Well, yeah, that's true. That's what he's most famous for. But he lived 950 years, 600 years before the flood and 350 years after the flood. There's a whole lot of crazy, wild and wacky stuff that goes on on both sides of the flood. And so if I'm to take the full 950 years of Noah's days, then the last days are going to be very interesting. And they're going to include all kinds of things like giants, like animal human hybrids. And we haven't seen giants, although there are reports, believe it or not, that our troops discovered some um, in Afghanistan, uh, very large cannibalistic red hair giants. People can Google that. Um, oh, yeah. Report, and da- reports, down in Peru, too. Down in Peru. Yeah. I think um, I recently watched a, uh, an episode of uh, Prophecy in the News, uh, Gary Stearman, um, uh, having uh, Lynn Marzulli on and talking about um uh the discoveries down in Peru of the same type of um you know skulls with the red hair uh yeah. and it, they're they're all over the place they're not just they're not i guess what i'm trying to say is that they're not just um right in the middle east you know they're all over the world yes they are uh they, in fact i'm reading a book right now uh, i forget the title of it but it was it's dealing with uh meriwether lewis you know lewis and clark and uh, you, if you grew up in Springfield, you may remember Lewis and Clark of Memorial Drive. Sure, was a was a drugstore. It was the first job I ever had, other than a paper <laughs> route. After I, after I got rid of my paper route, <laughs> oh yeah, uh, the Holyoke Transcript. I worked at Lewis and Clark, um, and you know they their logo was a kind of a caricature of of Lewis and Clark, the explorers. Um, and so I'm reading this book right now about the the uh, expeditions of Lewis and Clark and. Uh, they traveled for a while together, but then they split up at one point, and uh, Meriwether Lewis went uh, north, I believe, and Clark went south, and, and they did their own little exploration and met up again and came back. But then later, uh, Lewis was murdered, and a lot of his writings were suppressed. And around that same time, the Smithsonian Institute was created, supposedly – to uh, be sort of the guardian of, of American heritage and stuff. Oh, of course. But but, but it, the exact opposite is true. Right. It was designed to be like the Vatican, to cover up and hide and store things they don't like Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, <laughs> you know, that big warehouse with all the stuff where they don't want anybody to know. You know, that's real. That is fact. That is true. Uh, when they did their research for Raiders of the Lost Ark, I think they became aware of that. Uh, in oh, that absolutely. Final scene. As a matter of fact, this is one thing that I've learned in my um, in my journey, both intellectually and spiritually, that reality is 180 degrees out of phase with uh, <laughs> the way we perceive reality is 180 degrees out of phase of what reality really is. So <laughs> I, and I always go into things looking that way, you know, as far as uh, like you said, the Smithsonian. Oh, yes, it's this museum to preserve history and everything. No, no, 
<laughs> not, not at all. It's a, it's the museum to suppress history and put yes. forward a propagandic, uh, the propaganda of a worldview that they want you to believe. And anything that conflicts with evolution is pushed aside, hidden, you know, spirited away, and you don't see it. And you know they'll kill the opposition. You know, people like Lewis, uh, and and you know he was writing about giants, and you can go back even uh, further to the conquistadors and stuff, and when. Uh, Cortez and these guys are going through Florida and, you know, and Mexico and different places. And they're writing a lot about encountering giants. Um, they're, my, my next book is going to deal with the diaspora of the giants. Uh, everybody talks about the diaspora of the Jews and the Israelites and stuff. Well, you know, you got to remember uh, when they came into the promised land after the Exodus that uh, Joshua and his boys did a good job. They didn't get all of them, but they did a good job of wiping out the giants uh, and chasing them out. And, you know, they went north and they went south and they went overseas and they ended up over here. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, that is an interesting t- that's something that we we have to get into uh, uh, in in the next half hour, because um, a lot there's a lot of questions to that. You know, how come the flood didn't wipe them all out? Uh, you know, yeah, and then yeah. and then you can get into like um, uh, there's different theories on it. One of them being the multiple incursion theory. Uh, right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people that think that, uh, you know, it was an alien presence or a, um, a fallen angel presence after the flood. Uh, I, I'm, I'm like you in the regards. I'm not really too big of a fan on the multiple incursion theory. Um, yeah. And, and um, really it's about, you know, the genetics that really kind of keyed me in on why I don't think that that's the case. But, yeah. um, but when we come back, folks, we'll get into much more of this with Rob Skiba, his website, kingsgatemedia.com, kingsgatemedia.com. You can also follow him on Facebook uh, and uh, check out all of the great work that he has. Um, Fantastic author and public speaker. We'll be back with much more right after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back, everybody. Joe Joseph here. You're listening to the Freedom Link on Truth Frequency Radio, truthfrequencyradio.com, 90.7 FM Denver. And my special guest is Rob Skiba. His website, kingsgatemedia.com. Go there today. Check out all the great books and DVDs he has available for you to uh, learn more about uh, about the Bible and the extra-biblical texts like the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jubilees, the Book of Jasher, uh, and, and how he puts all of this uh, together and gives you a different view on things that actually makes the Bible come to life, which is very important in our society today because everything is built around entertainment. So if you can if you can understand it from an entertaining perspective, you might be able to reach out to those people whose hearts may have waxed cold because of um, because of the dryness of the the history and all that stuff. But Rob, uh, you know, we're talking about the hybrids. I mean. It's interesting because we see like all of the uh, medieval tales and the talks of the griffins and the dragons mm-hmm. and all that, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. And even today we, we, we talk about it and it's myth to us, but to those people back then, it was real, wasn't it? Yeah, it was very real. And going back to what King Wells said, looking at the Bible from a mythological worldview, you got to remember, like they thought Paul was Mercury the messenger of the gods and Paul and Barnabas was uh, Zeus, <laughs> you know? Uh, so this shows you something. It shows you the mentality of those people. They didn't just look, look at that as, you know, funny fairy tale myth. They, they looked at the characteristics of Paul and Barnabas and they immediately thought, well, Paul, he's the spokesperson. He's the messenger of the gods. He must be Mercury. And, and Barnabas, well, he must be Zeus, you know? Um, it, it shows that they believe this stuff, not as myth, but as fact. And when you start going through the scriptures with that mentality, just kind of looking at what you're reading in the Bible, trying to put on, if you will, a mythological mentality, 
uh, and you realize that these things were, were written at a time when people really did believe in those gods. And when you look at the book of Exodus uh, and what was going on with the plagues, and you realize that each of the 10 plagues in the book of Exodus was specifically targeted to a different god of the Egyptians. You know, that there was a god for each one of the, the characteristics of the plague, and, and, and the last one being Osiris. Right. That, you know, God was showing that he, yod heh vav heh Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you choose to pronounce it, uh, is the God of gods, King of kings, Lord of lords. He's above all, and I'm proving it. <laughs> you know? Right, right. Uh, there's no other God but him. And when you realize that the Exodus really was a showdown, I mean, it was God against the gods. Uh, he, the Bible really starts to come alive with some of these stories. Uh, I mean, it, it's epic. And you got crazy things like, uh, people can just go- do a Google search on Hittites and um, stone carvings and stuff like that and Chimera. And you'll see that the Hittites were very fond of, of carving various depictions of different types of animal-human hybrids. Uh, you know, people with lion heads and human bodies. Oh, wait a minute. Doesn't the Bible say something about some guys warring against the lion men of Moab? <laughs> you know, in the Second Samuel? You're like, lion men of lion Moab? Lion men of Moab? Yeah, what's that? <laughs> I know. You know uh, but if you I'm, take but, it literally, if you take it yeah, literally the way it's written. If you written, take it literally and you realize that they were going up against people who were carving pictures of lion men, um, you know, I mean, it's, it takes a lot of effort to take a block of stone and carve out very detailed pictures. You know, it's not somebody just doing it just because, you know, they're bored. They, there was a reason why they were doing these things, and there's a lot of it. I mean, look at the Egyptian hieroglyphs. You know, Horus. Uh, you know, um, what's the what's the jackal-headed one there? Um, Anubis. Uh, I mean, you've got especially in the, the Egyptian pantheon. You got all sorts of animal-human hybrids going on. Same thing in the Sumerian. You know, and in the Greeks, they're everywhere. And so uh, there's this one picture that really caught my attention as I was going through the Hebrew. Before I tell you about this picture, uh, I, Chuck Missler had done something I, I saw where he took the, the, the meanings of the names of the first 10 patriarchs before the flood yeah. from Adam to Noah. And, you know, we know that they named their children things that meant things. You know, um, Esau came out red and hairy, so they named him red and hairy because that's what Esau means. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. uh, Jacob came out grabbing his heels, so they named him heel grabber. That's what Jacob means. You know, <laughs> their, their, their names have meaning. And oh, right. Missler looked at the names from Adam to Noah and looked up their Hebrew meanings and strung them together in a sentence. In the order that they're given, it comes out, uh, man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that with his death, death the despairing shall find rest. I mean, how incredible is that? See, now that's something that's that, crazy. And it's not, that's like God's fingerprint on certain things. I'll give you another one. There's a... Um, there's an equidistant letter sequence yes. in, in the first five books of the Old Test of the Torah, the Hebrew Torah, yes. uh, where it's, um, it, it's unbelievable uh, that I, every, what is it, every, um, every seventh letter, it spells Torah in Genesis and Exodus. And Genesis and Exodus. And then, in, and then it spells yod heh vav heh in Leviticus. Right. And, and then in Numbers and Deuteronomy, it spells Torah backwards. Torah backwards, all pointing to Leviticus, where it says Yahweh, Yod yeah. Hey Vav Hey. I mean, I mean how I, crazy is that? You just don't do that. You know what I mean? That's that's one of those things that I, I just, from a human standpoint, how do you go about writing in such a fashion where that just falls into place? Yeah, Why? Because it's divinely inspired. Really, that's that's the only way I can I can make it make sense in my head. You know. Absolutely. And we know Paul says, you know, all scriptures given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We know that the scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit and written by men. But I would say the Torah is a, a step above that because it was dictated. <laughs> right. it, says, it tells you that Moses hung out twice, you know, on the mountain for extended periods of time, uh, you know, 40 days up there. And it says that he spoke with God face to face as one speaks with a friend. You know, so, I mean, that's pretty huge. And while he's doing that, God himself is writing with his own finger the Ten Commandments in stone and handing them to him, you know. Right, which which really, you know, folks, I, that if you don't understand, there's there's meaning to that. You know, when you write something in stone with your own finger, 
that <laughs> that that's pretty heavy stuff you know a lot of people say well the law was nailed to the cross the the uh, yeah. the the 10 commandments don't matter no, they don't matter anymore and my my thing is um it's funny because i i believe it was yeshua in the new testament if you love me keep my commandments you, you know and I, I, it's really simple <laughs> and you know it really is and in first john 2 i see when people get all messed up between the law and grace I, i'm like yeah. well, go to first read first john 2 through 5 because first john 2 starts off by saying i'm writing this so that you don't sin first john 3 defines sin as transgression of the law and he says but if you do then you've got jesus christ the righteous who's your advocate so you're covered you know he he, got, he takes care of you you're good pick up and where you left off and do better next time you know uh, and then when you get to First John 5, he says, this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, his commandments are not burdensome. So it's not a, it's not a have to, it's a get to. Right. And it should be a fruit, not a root of your salvation. If you're saved, it's supposed to be written on your heart and on your mind. And if it's in you, how can you be under it? People are like, don't get me under the law. I'm like, well, how can I get you under something that's supposed to be in you? <laughs> you know, it <laughs> no, doesn't make any sense. No, you're right. You know, I'm, I'm totally there with you, man. So. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's unbelievable how the deception. There's been deception all through all through biblical history, all through human history, and um, and this being one, the repression of what actually occurred back in these days. I mean, it's unbelievable. Oh, it is, and you know, taking Mistler's cue on the the meaning of the names. You know, there's a lots of places in the Torah where you're reading so and so we get so and so, and it's all those names you can't pronounce, and you're like, yeah, right. yeah, whatever, and you just skip over it. You know, uh, I know I did. Until I got a hold of that idea that, well, wait a minute, the names mean things, and there could be hidden code, codes just like what Missler discovered. And so I, the best $5 I ever spent is a really short little book called A Dictionary of Scripture Proper Names by J.B. Jackson. And all it is is all the names in the Bible and the corresponding Hebrew meaning for their names. And so as I started going through various genealogies and stringing their me the meaning of their names together in the same order that the names are listed, just like Missler did, dude, I found lots of crazy stuff in there, like, totally <laughs> hidden, hidden stuff. Like, for instance, the, the meaning of the names of, of Ham's children okay. in Genesis 10, 6 through 20. And this is what's actually steered me off of the uh, multiple incursions thesis you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Now, most Nephilim researchers... They say, well, you know, angels just came back and made it with women again. And I'm like, well, okay, it's a nice theory, but give me one scripture that supports that. <laughs> You're not yeah, and it. just well, just like just like in uh, journalism, you always want to have two sources. And yeah, I think you bring, that, you bring that up all, all the time. You know, you you should have two sources to validate that. The, the Bible, actually, folks, if you don't know how to read the Bible, you have a concordance, and in that concordance, it takes you to a corresponding passage that validates what the other passage says. It gives you another, another, fr another frame of reference to go by yeah. to kind of set it in stone to solidify it. Yeah, you, you, the, in multiple places, it's the Bible tells us we need two to three witnesses to establish truth. So if if you're hanging an entire belief or a doctrine on one phrase and one sentence in the entire Bible, it's not a good idea. Right. You, you need a confirming witness. And when I started looking for a confirming witness for the assumption, the Genesis 6-4, because it says Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward, um, well, it says, and also after that. So that begs the question is, wh wh when was the that and how far after was it? Um, and when I was looking for confirming evidence, both in the canonized text as well as the extra-biblical text that I call, I refer to them as the synchronized, biblically endorsed extra-biblical text, because they follow the same chronological order of events that Genesis does, so they're synchronized. They're biblically endorsed because the Bible itself, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, refers to these books, infers things that can only be found in these books, quotes them, and mentions them by name. So I'm going, well, you know, if it's good enough for the Holy Spirit-inspired authors to do that, why, why not check it out myself, you know? Um, and so when I start looking into these things, I, I'm, I, that's where you start seeing a whole lot of, of things that you may not have seen before or that are not just blatantly obvious in, for instance, the text of Genesis. When you read the book of Jubilees, you find Jubilees 724 says, and after this, and something happens. The after this of Jubilee 724 is identical to the after that of Genesis 6-4, and it's entirely in a pre-flood context. What was going on? Well, first of all, uh, the Genesis 6 experiment, to my calculations anyway, 
happened in about 3550 BC in the days of Jared. And his name means descended. I believe he was named that because that's when the fallen angels descended. Uh, they looked up and said, hey, they're descending. Hey, you got a newborn baby here. Well, well let's name him descended. <laughs> you know, it, it was a pretty pivotal event in that kid's life, you know? Right, sure. Uh, well, that's 3550 BC. Enoch chapter 10 says the first generation Nephilim or the titans of Greek mythology, uh, were to kill each other off in a massive civil war. Well, that's what the Greeks stylized into what became known as the Clash of the Titans we mentioned earlier. Oh, my. Well, that ended, the Clash of the Titans ended at, at about 3000 B.C. And what's interesting about 3000 B.C. is there's a lot of things leading up to it. Um, 3114 B.C. is when the Aztec calendar stone, the Mayan calendar, that shows up at 3114. BC. About 20 years later, you have the death of the first man, Adam. He dies. Uh, about 20, 25 years later is when the end of the Clash of the Titans is. So the first generation Nephilim are gone, dead. They've killed each other off. Then you have the judgment of the Watchers. Their parents are judged, bound, and buried. And mem remember this, we'll come back to it, for 70 generations. They were to be buried under the sands of the earth for 70 generations. That's roughly 3,000 B.C. when that took place. Okay. And then e Enoch is raptured, and about 70 years later, Noah's born, and his daddy takes a deep breath and names him Rest. Well, oh, that's Lamech's interesting. Name, yeah, his, Noah's name means Rest. Why? Because he was born after the chaos of the Clash of the Titans, whereas his father, Lamech, his name means Despairing. Well, duh. Methuselah <laughs> named him despairing because he lived, he was boring during the time of the Clash of the Titans, you know. And what, um, what a chaotic time that must have been, you know. Just like we chaos. think of as was in the days of Noah, so will it be, you know. Wow, chaotic time. It, just like today, very chaotic, very, very, very chaotic. Just yeah, no, prior different... to the days of Noah, you know, it was chaotic. And today, very chaotic. Yeah, it, at, but at the time of his birth, there was a, there was a, a reprieve. It was, there was a calm. Uh -huh. um, and, and it lasted for a little while because uh, you got 600 years to the flood from Noah's birth, um, 700 years from the from the judgment of the watchers. So that's the that's the what happened. That's the that. OK, where it says and also after that, right. that's the that <laughs> the that is 3550 B.C. The Genesis six experiment takes place. 3000 B.C. The judgment of the watchers and their children is done. That's the that. After that is the 700 years leading up to the flood from that point forward. That's when you find that the extra biblical texts come in very handy in filling in the gaps. Joshua 418 tells you that in the latter days of Methuselah, the last 120 years of Methuselah's life, um, man began to blend species together in order therewith to provoke the Lord. And it, that was what led to the corruption of all flesh. Genesis 6.12 tells us all flesh had become corrupted. Well, that's as Paul Harvey would say the rest of the story. Genesis Joshua 4.18 fills in a massive blank there, and Jubilees is a confirming witness to Joshua, where it says, and after this, now the, the prior verses, this is Jubilees 7.24, 1 through 23, verses 1 through 23, tells you about the watchers coming down, mating with women, the judgment, all that. And then it says, and after this, men began to blend species. And it talks about they sinned against the birds and the animals, the, the lizards, the reptiles, uh, the fish. And that's where you have the creation of animal-human hybrids in the last 120 years. Now, that's something that you can repent of. That was the activity of men, and we know Peter and others tell us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He preached repentance for 120 years. Well, what, what nationality are you, Joe? What's your, what's your heritage? Uh, I'm of Italian and Irish descent. Can you repent of that? I cannot. Neither can I. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm Scottish, French, Polish, okay? I'm so Polish they put the ski in front of the name. <laughs> <laughs> You know, <laughs> Skiba is my last name. Everybody else I grew up with in Chicopee. Like, I was you know, going to say you're from Chicopee, so you had yeah, to be. the Kabasa Festival, you know, <laughs> Zabowski and Zawowski and, you know, all the, everybody. Okay, but I, neither one of us can repent of that. We, you cannot repent of, of being born what you're born. So it makes no sense to preach that Noah was, was preacher of righteousness against the Nephilim, angel-human hybrids, because they can't repent of that. They were born that way. What, what choice did they have? Right. Um, that was not the issue. The issue was transhumanism. And that Jesus, Yeshua, said that as it was in the days of Noah, not Jared. Jared was the days angels made with humans. Noah, in the last 120 years leading up to the flood, at the time, last years of Methuselah's life, 
was a time when men began to blend species. And guess what? That's exactly what's happening when you turn on the evening news. A few years ago, uh, the UK announced the creation of 150 animal-human chimeras in the laboratory. Um, and if that's what they're telling us, just imagine what they're not telling imagine us. Imagine what they're not telling. I was just going to say that. Good grief. Um, yeah. And, and Island of Dr. Moreau. Oh, yeah. When you brought up a, a, a term that has gotten a lot of mainstream exposure lately, and that's transhumanism. And uh, transhumanism has taken on um, a life of its own now in our time, uh, especially with the idea that you can merge humans with machines, you know, yeah. and that I look at that. I'm like, good grief. If God doesn't intervene, what's going to happen when well, you he take says that? Yeah. yeah. Yeshua says, it's except those days be shortened. No flesh will survive. Oh, I totally so, believe it. No yeah, doubt. I mean, if they keep going, I mean, they're all talking about it. I mean, we've seen the movies. We've seen, you know, uh, Lawnmower Man, Transcendence, uh, Terminator. Uh, you know, we've seen where these things end. <laughs> yeah, it's and never it's good. Never good. Never good. No, it's not. And it, but that's what's that's what happened in the days leading up. Probably not so much machinery, but the blending of of animals with humans. And interestingly enough, as I'm doing this research, because Genesis also tells you that the uh, the heart and imagination of men became only evil continually. And I thought, well, you know, there've been a lot of bad people in the world. I mean, the Nazis were pretty evil, but sure. they, surely they had a ten, tender moment with their spouse and children. You know, they weren't only evil continually, even though they did a lot of bad stuff. Um, so I started thinking, well, what would cause that? You know, to have only evil continually? I see no evidence of angels mating with women. That that happened, you know, 700 years prior. So, uh, or actually, 1,200 years prior to the flood. So. Um, as I'm thinking about this, I go see the the Amazing Spider-Man with, with the one with Dr. Connors, who becomes the lizard. And spoiler alert, if people haven't seen it yet, but th he's a he's a doctor who is missing part of his arm. He's he's an amputee from the elbow down, and uh, you know obviously he would like to have his arm back. And he's trying to figure out how can he help other people who have lost limbs. And you know he's doing experiments with lizards because you can chop their tail off and it grows back. So he's like. Well, what's the genetic code that allows that to happen? So he cuts off the legs of mice and stuff and starts injecting mice with lizard DNA until finally he gets a viable subject and the leg grows back. So he's like, aha, I've got it figured out. And he injects himself in his stump of his arm uh, with lizard DNA. And sure enough, his arm grows back. Yay! Oh, but, man. But he has an unfortunate side effect. He becomes a giant lizard human hybrid that has only evil continually in his heart and mind isn't it um, isn't it interesting too that satan's referred to as a serpent as a reptile yeah exactly yeah and and you know speaking of that you know hovind has a different take on t-rex i personally believe t-rex was genetically engineered i know he has a different take on that but um be, because the long neck long tail dinosaurs the vegetarian class dinosaurs yeah you actually see evidence, and there's some reason to believe that there could still be some of them around now um, in the jungles of Congo and whatnot. Uh, you know, that the movie Babe that came out back like in the 80s or whatever uh, is loosely based on truth. Um, uh, you know, Loch Ness Monster, some of these things. We see evidence of the, the herbivore, you know, good dinosaurs, if you will. Right. Surviving the flood, and in, even in the recent memory of man, because they're— Indian depictions of humans with long neck dinosaurs carved on stone. Um, okay, well, the only way that's possible is if they made it on the ark. Um, but you don't see people hanging around with velociraptors, you know. No, uh, no, no. They, yeah. Mm -mm. T Rex and stuff. Um, so it is my theory uh, that when you read, especially if you read Jubilees 724 and Joshua 418 and the Genesis account where it talks about violence and everything, that uh, those were genetically engineered from existing. Uh, good dinosaurs into the you know really bad vicious dinosaurs because genesis says all flesh had become corrupted and jubilee says that men began to sin against the lizards and you know so i, I kind of put that together and go well maybe that's what happened um and at the means in, in the same time you had the creation of animal human hybrids and uh, i mean isn't it funny that hollywood gets it the church is completely clueless um but hollywood's showing this stuff on a fairly regular basis. And I have a theory about that. I think how many, how many artists, musicians, actors have you, do we have to hear say 
yeah, I channeled this from, you know, and this information, you know, and, you know, you got, what's it, Sasha Fierce or whatever, Beyonce, and, you know, all these people saying that they have other entities that they commune with. Uh, uh, Rawlings, when she was talking about her fictional series, uh, said that, yeah, I mean, these characters came to her in dreams and visions that, you know, it could be that entities fallen from the fallen realm are telling their story. <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's I kind of believe that, you know, that a, at least in, in my guesstimation um, that the these entities or spirits or whatever that they're talking to are actually like disembodied Nephilim. Oh, yeah. Uh, Enoch chapter 15 tells right. you that's exactly what uh, demons are not fallen angels. Fallen angels get around just fine. They have bodies of their own. They're good to go. Demons, on the other hand, are always looking for a body to get into. And so that 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 sort of is the setup for why did man all of a sudden one day wake up and say, hey, you know what? I think I want to blend myself with a goat. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> yeah. why? Yeah. Kind why? of That's, today, uh, yeah. you know, uh, 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 baseball's old hat, football's old hat. Let's yeah, see. Yeah, let's blend yeah. ourselves with a horse. Let's blend myself with a horse, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you got plan A. Cain kills Abel. Okay, Seth is born. Nobody's able to get the Seth. Plan B, Genesis 6, let's uh, go ahead and mate with women and create giants and wipe out everybody that way. Well, God puts a stop to that, judges the watchers, and the Nephilim kill each other off. Plan, the next plan, plan C, is the creation of animal-human hybrids for the purpose of bringing back a return of the Nephilim before the flood. Everybody talks about after the flood, but I'm like, wait, wait, wait. There was a return of the Nephilim before the flood. And but this is a different variety. This is an animal human hybrid, not an angel human hybrid. Um, and the reason I say that this was plan C is because, OK, Enoch 15 says kill an angel human hybrid and the, the spirit goes out and becomes a demon. OK. OK. So I don't know how many there were, presumably quite a quite a lot. Um, and these things are all running around doing their thing. I mean, they're all over the New Testament. Jesus cast them out left and right. Thousand of them in one guy, you know. So. uh we know that God specifically said that he created everything to reproduce after its own kind. Over and over and over again, we see that. Everything reproduces after its own kind. And we see there God breathes into Adam and he becomes a living soul. In Hebrew, that, that's nefesh. He becomes a living nefesh. That's the soul, the spirit it, it, that animates us. Um, and, and, but the same thing's used for the living creatures. They became a living nefesh. So I, Paul later says there's one flesh for birds, one for animals, one for humans. You know, he's kind of reiterating the idea of after its kind. So I believe that there is a God-prescribed nefesh specific to humans. There's one specific to dogs, cats, birds, lizards, whatever. Every, you know, God has a nefesh related to each kind. So then what happens if you blend a human and a cow? Ooh, well, not good. Well, yeah, you don't have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into it. You have a cow nefesh and a human nefesh, but right. when you blend them together, you don't have a God-prescribed nefesh to go into it because there's no blend, you know? Uh, so what all you've done is create what I believe is a host body that is suitable for a different spirit to enter. Well, you just so happen to have a whole bunch of them looking for bodies. So, <laughs> Isn't that uh, interesting? Isn't that interesting? And if all these, you know, former Titan Nephilim enter these the bodies of these centaurs and minotaurs and satyrs, well, then, you know, creatures like Pan make perfect sense, uh, you know, that are connivers and evil and, you know, stuff like that. Oh, absolutely. You know, it also, we, we look at um, the way they're doing cloning these days and, and, yeah. and everything like that. And it makes you wonder, you know, are these, de uh, these demons, what's go into that? yeah, what's going into it? That's, these are all very relevant questions, folks. And I mean, it, really, when you start digging into this, this is a, fascinating subject and really gives you a lot of answers as to why we are where we are today we're our number one's done our number two's on the way when we come back more with rob skiba don't forget to visit his website kingsgatemedia.com that's kingsgatemedia.com oh boy another hour of great radio to come right on the other side of the break we'll be right back this is truth frequency radio no hate no hype no fear. Real people. Real radio. Coward is asked the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? 
but conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must do it because conscience tells him it is right. Every time our country stands in the path of danger, an instinct seems to summon her finest first, those who truly understand her. When freedom shivers in the cold shadow of true peril, it's always the patriots who first hear the call. When loss of liberty is looming as it is now, the siren sounds first in the hearts of freedom's vanguard. Fighting for humanity and against globalism, one mind at a time. It's the Freedom Link with Joe Joseph. Welcome back, everybody. It's hour number two of the Freedom Link right here on Truth Frequency Radio, truthfrequencyradio.com, 90.7 FM, Denver. And we're uh, just trucking along, myself and Rob Skiba of, of kingsgatemedia.com. Make sure you check that out. He's got such an awesome array of DVDs and books to go check out and uh, support him and his efforts to uh, get this research done, get it out to people, because this puts a whole new twist on the Bible. And what a great night of radio we've had at uh, Truth Frequency Radio with uh, the Kev Baker Show, having Max Egan on uh, tonight uh, in his broadcast, and then uh, moving over to Rob, and then down the rabbit hole with Popeye coming up at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. So, uh, folks, if you can, you know, support Truth Frequency Radio because it's through listener support that we're able to keep on going. So if you can, go uh, subscribe. I think it's like $4 a month to uh, get a subscription to the high-quality archives and support Truth Frequency Radio. (laughs) Kev Baker, always good with sayings, my woo brings out the best in you. (laughs) That's awesome, my man. And, uh, again, Rob Skeep is my guest. Rob, um, we were talking about d- definitions of names and just how incredibly important it is to understand the meanings of some of these names. Uh, during the break, you brought up the, the names in Genesis 10. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that this is one of the things that moved me off the multiple incursions deal is I found, you know, n- no indications that angels ever again mated with women. So I'm like, well, OK, what what, what would be the alternative, you know? And you see the creation of these animal-human hybrids and the corruption of all flesh through transhumanism. And then on the other side of the flood, you have the, what they call the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10, where they so-and-so beget, so-and-so beget, so-and-so. And so and so and we usually skip past a lot of that stuff because we, we can't pronounce the names. We, you know, so what, you know. But taking Chuck Missler's cue, I decided yeah, I'm going to go and, and define the, the meanings of the names. Now, in Shem and Japheth's offspring, um, they're pretty normal, you know, nothing, nothing really there. I mean, they're pretty normal names. But when you get to the children of Ham, uh, they had some really strange names. And I'm not going to go through all of them. I'll just read you this, the paragraph that you end up with. Sure. If you, if you take all their names and put them together, string them together like Chuck Missler did, in the order that they're given using the meaning of their names, this is what you end up with. He raged a black terror, double straight afflicted trafficker, Black terror, drink thou anguish, compass the chamber, thunder, compass the smiting. He who is coming, their love, we shall rebel. That's Nimrod right there. A double straight firebrand, travailing, affliction of water, blades opening the moistened morsel, forgiven ones bowing to spy. A trafficker hunting terrors, trodden down sayers, the strangers draw near. Showers of life, gnawing like thorns, they shall break loose, double woolen enclosures of wrath. And I'm like, okay, what, pronou- what, what, what possesses two proud parents to look down at their newborn baby and name it Enclosure of Wrath? What do you think, honey? You know, <laughs> uh, uh, um, a deer. No, uh, no um, I think I like terrors better. Let's name it. Terrors, it yeah, terrors you know, is or, always good. Yes. Or, or, you know, thorns or blades. You know, it's like uh, something's clearly up with these kids. And those are the same ites that the Israelites were told repeatedly by Yahweh to utterly destroy, kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, wipe out everybody. Now, this solved a big dilemma for me because in the New Testament, John uh, 14, I believe, Philip 
asked Jesus, hey, what's, you know, show us the Father and it'll be sufficient. And Jesus says, what are you talking about, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen my Father. Well, that never computed in my head because, uh-huh. you know, Yeshua, he's like, you know, hanging out with publicans and sitters. He's not judging anybody. He loves everybody. He's healing everybody. He casting out demons. What a guy. But dad, on the other hand, is kill the women, kill the children, wipe out the animals, kill everybody. Ah! <laughs> and I'm, I'm like, I don't get it, man. Well, that's like, that's one of the things, believe it or not, and that uh, really, um, especially with our listeners here, that's the one thing that, that I get from them is, if your God's supposed to be so loving, then why does he kill everybody in the Old Testament? Well, there's your answer right there, because th- those, and you, tr- and you trace them back to Genesis 10, 6 through 20, they're the ites that became the giants. They're the Amorites. Amos chapter 2, verse 9 tells us the Amorites got as tall as cedar trees. Well, a cedar tree, a modest cedar tree gets to about 35 feet tall. The cedars of Lebanon got to 150 feet tall. What did the spies say when they went in the land? Oh, we feel like grasshoppers compared to those guys. Well, yeah. Hello? That wasn't metaphoric. I mean, that was like literal. We, wow. No, it Whoa. says they are of great stature. I right. mean, they make a point of, of repeatedly telling us that there, and they mentioned the Anakim. Now, the Anakim were sons of Anak, who was a son of Arba, who was an Amorite. The Amorites come from Canaan, come from Ham, stepped off the ark with no mention of angels anywhere in the picture. So the Bible has told you exactly who begat who, who's the father of who, and oh, by the way, those are the same who that Yahuwah said to the Israel, utterly destroy. Kill the women, kill the children, kill the animals, utterly destroy everything. The same people. So now it changes your view. God is no longer... Uh, prejudiced and schizophrenic and into random acts of genocide. Uh, and now he's a loving God who is trying to eradicate the fallen seed from the earth. Isn't to that protect, interesting? To protect his good seed, the good people. Um, yeah, it's very interesting because, you know, now it changes the entire picture. God's not this crazy guy in the Old Testament. He's a God of love who loves his children is trying to protect them. And he's saying, hey, the bullies over there, get rid of the bullies. You know, because the longer they're around, the, the worse things are going to get. Here, here's, and, a, here's a question for you. Um, why do you think that the Book of Enoch, Jasher, and Jubilees were kept out of the canon? Because it seems to me that they are pivotal to understanding um, God's character and really putting the pieces of the puzzle together. I think you answered your question <laughs> because Oops. You know, the, the, the devil wants nothing more than to paint God as, as somebody of poor character. You know, of, of bad. Don't, you don't want God. God is evil. God is, you know, and so if he can do everything, and, and even in the Sumerian mythologies, uh, uh, Enlil is painted as the Yahweh character, and Enki is really the serpent in the garden. You know, uh, if you look at what both of those characters did in their mythology, it's very much similar, you know, not exact, but very similar to the attributes of God the Father and Lucifer. Oh, right. And, and Absolutely. so it's like, you know, Enlil creates humans, but then they start getting really noisy and he can't stand the, stand the noise. So he says, yeah, I'm going to wipe them all out with a flood. Well, Enki, you know, uh, looks at what big, big, bad Enlil has planned and he goes and tells Noah, hey, this is what what's what, what the plan is. You better build yourself a boat, you know. Uh, so, you know, Enki's painted as the, the hero, you know, that helps people and, and Enlil's the bad guy. Well, you know, it's the, the roles are reversed. Um, and so, I mean, that's one of the reasons. Um, but also uh, around 300, I think, or so A.D., uh, if I remember, different people come along and they, they couldn't wrap their minds around the idea that angels made it with women. So they just dismissed it. And they come up with brand new theories like, well, the sons of God in Genesis 6 are really the sons of Seth. They're the good sons of Seth mating with the bad daughters of Cain. And I, I've got a big problem with that because, well, it doesn't say that, for one. For two, um, if the sons of Seth are supposedly the good guys and the daughters of men are the daughters of Cain, the bad guys, why is it that the good guys are doing the bad thing in the text? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're raping the women and doing you know, supposedly a bad thing. And third, how do kissing cousins produce Aga Bashan, 15, 8 feet tall, 18 feet tall? Uh, how do they produce Amorites? Yeah, kissing cousins, I don't care how much spinach you feed them, are not going to produce giants. You know, the, the whole thing makes no sense at all. Uh, the book of Job uh, specifically refers to the angels as sons of God when the sons of God presented themselves and Satan was among them. Um, it, it, and the, the ancient record is unanimous. 
and it, it is unanimous in their agreement that the sons of God is a reference to angels. The book of Enoch tells you that point blank. Jubilees does. Josephus, the first century historian, does. Uh, many of the church fathers did as well. It's not till you get later that you get somebody who disagrees with it, and he's like, yeah, and then, you know, now that's actually the dominant view taught in seminaries today is what's called the Sethite view. It's completely bogus, uh, and it doesn't answer any of the, the, the problems that we read about in Scripture, uh, namely why God's all, you know, kill the women, kill the children, and all that, and, and giants, where'd they come from? Yeah, but so, when, you, when you put it in the, in the aspect of the genetics, you know, of genetic corruption, it makes total sense. It makes total sense. And then if you look at the character of the giants and, and what they did, and you now let's, let's just let's put it in perspective here, you know, if you're a 150 foot giant, you're hungry. Uh-huh. You're, you're going to eat a lot. So yeah. if you've got a, a, a an earth full of giants, um, they're basically going to eat themselves, and then they're going to start eating themselves. And I, th- I think the Bible gets into that, yeah, cannibalism that. and all that stuff. And what did they say when they came back? The spies said the land devours itself. Well, of course. Doug Hamp, another researcher, he's done a marvelous job in his book, um, Corrupting the Image, where he takes Aga Bashan, who we have – description of the size of his bed, you know, and the size of his bed indicates that the guy was between 15 and 18 feet tall, you know, 15, 18 feet tall. This guy's pretty huge. And, uh, you know, about three times the size of a normal human being. And he uses the basal metabolic rate. You know, what, what, how many calories we have to eat per day just to keep our heart beating. Uh, and he applies that to the, the size of Og. And I forget what it was, but it's pretty awesome when the, the way he laid it out, like how many, dozens of cheeseburgers or you know pizzas or whatever he'd have to eat per day just to keep his heart beating um but then he points out that he wasn't just lying there in bed with his heart beating this guy was a warrior so you know he had to eat a lot and even the the american indians the hopi have legends of these redhead headed giants that while running would scoop up buffalo in their arms while they were running you know and take them away you know go eat them um they had mega appetites just to keep themselves alive, and I believe they were they got into uh, GMO, genetic modification of of plants, specifically the grapes. Uh, we we see the spies bring back a cluster of grapes. It takes two guys to carry a cluster of grapes on yeah. a pole. That's and crazy. Interest, yeah, I, while I was doing this research, uh, my wife came in with and, and had a bowl of grapes for me to 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 eat, and and I was literally on that part in the book of numbers when she gives me a bowl of grapes and in it was a full cluster of grapes. So I thought, huh? So I grabbed the cluster of grapes and went in the bathroom and I held the cluster up to my head just to get a scale. How big does the cluster of grapes look to a human head? And the cluster of grapes that I had was pretty close to the same size as my head. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go into the computer and, and I got some 3d authoring software, you know, and I, I create a 3d person and a cluster of grapes. And I just scaled the cluster of grapes and the human you know, with the the head the same size as a grape, I kept sizing it up till it got to the size that I I'm 175 pounds. I know how much I'm capable of lifting. Uh, so I figured, how big would the grapes have to get before I'd have to ask a buddy for help? And and I kid you not, when I did that, just scaling them up together, the the grape scale tells you the size of the giants. By the time I would need a buddy to help me, uh, you're you're over 20 feet tall. Wow. You know? That's how big the – so I, I found that the grapes, the size of the grapes cluster actually indicates the scale of the giants. You're looking at anywhere from 20 to 35-foot tall right. giants. And, it, and if you look at the, fo- the quote, fossil record, um, that would seem to confirm it because they found skeletons, what, 36, 38 feet tall? Oh, well, yeah. It, well, there, yeah. Steve Quayle has done some great research uh, compiling evidence of giants that have been found throughout history. Yeah. And there are documented accounts in history of 35, 36 footers. Um, interestingly enough, Rockwall, Texas uh, is not too far from where I live here in Texas. Um, it, it, was, it was called Rockwall because back in the 1800s, some farmer or whatever is out digging a field or something. He hit, his shovel hits a rock. Well, no big deal. It's rocky. Kept digging, found more rocks, realized, it's, well, this looks like a rock wall. Kept digging. Well, it's a really big rock wall. Kept digging. It's a really long rock wall. So this became quite the thing. Everybody's really intrigued. What's this, you know, submerged rock wall, you know? 
And they eventually punched their way through part of the wall and ended up finding a room. And in the room was a cauldron that had human remains in it. So whoever was in there was apparently eating people. And then they found the skull of a person who was the skull was three times larger than an average human. So you know that places them in Og Bashan scale, 15 to 18 feet tall. And that's right here, you know, 45 minutes away from where I live. Yeah. And, you know, what did they do with the evidence? Well, they put Lake Ray Hubbard on top of it. They put a reservoir over the evidence. Um, but you can go back to the archives, uh, newspapers. There's another guy. I forget his name. Uh, I just got his book. And all it is is newspaper articles from like 1700s, 1800s, uh, early 1900s even, uh, of the United States uh, records of giants. And the average giant was 15 to 18 feet tall right so the, so these giants they they got all over the place like so, yeah so <laughs> this is a, i got a question from the chat room and i kind of missed it a little bit before but um gentleman skeptic in the in the chat room asked wouldn't this imply then that ham or at least his wife had tainted blood absolutely uh but not ham okay uh, and, and it wasn't just ham uh Jepeth has evidence of giants as well um uh gog and magog uh, you don't find this in scripture, but if you do a Google search on do Gog and Magog giant, you'll find lots of historical evidence that Gog and Magog were giants. And this was confirmed in 2006. I stood on the Great Wall of China uh, when I was a missionary over there. And, you know, if you've ever seen the Great Wall or ever been to it, this thing's huge, okay? It's it, ridiculously wide, tall, and long. It was originally known as the Ramparts of Magog. Well, I mean, if you're standing on this thing and you see how many people are on this thing, it's serious overkill if you're trying to keep out six-foot-tall invaders. But <laughs> when when you reckon that Gog and Magog were giants, well, all of a sudden a huge wall like that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, and so there's definitely evidence of giants in Japheth's line. I have no evidence that I could find anywhere in, in Shem's line. So I started to wonder, how is this possible? And if you've ever heard of the... Uh, tool in biology called a Punnett square. Okay. It's just, it's just a way of determining uh, if genetic traits will pass on to your offspring. If you and your wife have certain traits and you want to know if your offspring will, you can, it just, it's a way of determining the odds basically. So I thought, well, I'm going to do a Nephilim Punnett square. Now I went with the premise that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were all genetically pure because Genesis 6, uh, 8, 9 tells us that Noah was found perfect in his generations. Uh, he was a good guy, but that actually in Hebrew is the Hebrew word tamim, right. which is the word used for the pure red heifer, or, you know, or animal without spot or blemish. It, it, it's a term used for genetic purity. Okay. And, and, and his it, wife, his wife descended from Enoch, right? Yeah. She was uh, Enoch's daughter and he, Enoch was so righteous that God took him, you know, early. <laughs> right. So, uh, you know, being that, he, that Noah and his wife were both genetically pure, it stands to reason, obviously, that Shem, Ham, and Japheth were. But then you, and that's, that's the exception. Okay, that's what you read prior to verse 12 of Genesis 6. Then verse 12 tells you that all flesh became corrupted. So I just ask people, well, how much is all? You know, I, all means all. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's a Kent Hovind response, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's probably, where, that's probably exactly where that I is. That is, because I use that all the time. All means all. <laughs> yeah, does all mean all or not? And, it, and if it does mean all, then the first mention of the wives of the three sons is not until verse 18. Simple math. Is the 18 come before or after 12? Comes after. Well, and in the book of Joshua, second witness, it tells you point blank that Noah did not pick the three wives until seven days before the floodwaters came. Oh, wow. Well, and you'll note that none of their brothers made it on the ark. Their mother didn't make it on their ark. Their father didn't make it on the ark. No other relative made it on the ark. So clearly, you know, something's up with that family. Um, you know, because Noah's immediate family had Methuselah also died seven days before the flood, uh, and Lamech died earlier than that. He was he died at young at seven hundred seventy seven years. Um, so that was my first clue. I'm going okay. You know, all things being equal, Occam's razor says the simplest solution is is the right answer. You know, um, and so when I see on the post flood side the meaning of their names, specifically the names of, of Genesis ten six through twenty. Uh, it's very revealing. I mean, the giants, Amos 2.9, the Amorites are as tall as cedar trees. Am Amorites come from Canaan. Canaan come from Ham, who stepped off the ark with no mention of any angels. So I know who begat who, and I know Shem, Ham, and Japheth are all pure. Who's left? The wives. 
And so using that premise, if I've got a pure man, a man has an X chromosome and a Y chromosome. You only get the Y chromosome from your father, uh, which means every human being male on this planet has a Y chromosome that traces back to Adam. Uh, unless you believe in multiple incursions, then you got a really big problem because you got stray Ys all over the place um, and, and they're not redeemable. So if you have a man with a pure Y and a pure X and you got a female who has two X chromosomes, and I went with the premise of a 50-50 hybrid. So let's say she's got one good X chromosome and one tainted or corrupted chromosome uh, due to transhumanism. Well, you have a 50-50 chance of having a 100% normal child or a 50-50 chance of having a Nephilim hybrid. Ah. And I contend that the odds were contingent upon obedience because Scripture says the sins of the father are passed down to what? The third and fourth generation. And, you know, obviously, as soon as you get off the flood, off the ark, you know, Ham's doing something with, with his dad, you know, that's not cool. And I always was intrigued by the fact that he doesn't curse Ham. He curses his grandson, Canaan. Well, what do you know? Canaan is like loaded with Nephilim. <laughs> oh, right. Yeah. The land of Canaan was that. That was Nephilim well, city. Those were all the ites. Whenever you see multiple times in the Torah, you know, I keep talking about the Amorites because they were the most prominent. But, you know, the Amorite, the Gergeshite, the Jebusite, the Perizzite, you know, the Hivite. These are the ites that are repeatedly mentioned in Scripture as you got to utterly destroy them. Well, all of those ites trace back to Canaan. Um, now, Ham had four children. He had uh, Mitzrayim, Put, Cush, and Canaan. Now, we already talked about Canaan. There's right. no Nephilim that I'm aware of in Put's lineage, so he's good to go. There's no natural-born Nephilim in Cush's lineage. I say natural-born because Nimrod began to become a giant, but it was through some sort of transgenic experimentation, I would contend, not genetic birth. Right. Uh, so, you, you know, Cush's offspring are good to go. Uh, Mitzrayim, there's one candidate in Mitzrayim's lineage, but he had several other children that are completely normal, as far as I can tell, and that is Kaftor. Now, Kaftor became the father of the Philistines. Okay, well, Amorites are mentioned over 80 times in the Bible, and Philistines are mentioned over 200 times in the Bible, and in both cases, we know there are giants among them. Right. Uh, they are the arch enemies of Israel that they're always told to utterly destroy, kill them all. You know? Oh, right. And, so, and uh, that's the story of David and Goliath. Goliath was a David Philistine, Goliath, right? He's a runt. He's a runt of the litter at 9 to 12 feet tall. Right. And, and he's got four brothers who were born to the giant in Gath. So, uh, But here's the thing that intrigued me the most about Mitzrayim's son, Kaftor. Kaftor is the father of Philistines, but he he's the one that settled the island of Crete. Well, Crete is where all of Greek mythology comes from. So if you want to know where, you know, the, the legends of Hercules and Zeus and all of all that come from, well, he's the guy that settled there after the flood. So um, That's and, unbelievable. Oh, it's crazy. I mean, this is where this research will take you. It starts to explain the origin. That's why I did the DVD, and people can watch this on YouTube for free. If you go on YouTube and just punch in Mythology and the Coming Great Deception, it's an hour and a half long lecture that I, I trace all this stuff and, and show this stuff to you. Um, so you can check it out for free on YouTube. Um, but yeah, so Ham's, all of Ham's offspring are not bad. Uh, people get upset, especially, now I'll just say this, especially people of color. And and I'll just say right up front that I am in no way, shape, or form a prejudiced man. Right. Not at all. Um, uh, God's against prejudice, and so am I. Um, but they're under the, the the misconception that all black people come from Ham, and all white people come from Japheth, and all Asians come from Shem. Okay, think that through for a second. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm French, Scottish, and Polish. My wife is Italian. There is no way that either of us are going to get together and produce a, a Chinese child. It's not going to happen. <laughs> That is not going to happen. So if, I mean, and anybody can practice this at home if they'd like to, you know, to look for empirical, you know, let's do this. The, the, yeah, uh, let's do this empirically. Yes, everybody, yeah, let's, let's go try and make Chinese babies. Let's do some babies. experimentation, all right? <laughs> uh, and the Chinese out there who are listening, I want you to go, you know, get together with other Chinese people and try to produce a Caucasian or, or you know, a black child. It's not going to happen. Um, so why do we think that Noah and his wife produced three different races of people? And I don't even like saying that because there are not three races. There right. are humans. We, the There's human one race. race. Right. Yeah, period. Human race. We all red blood. And, and the only difference is, is slightly different 
bone structure features, which can be done through controlled breeding experiments, just like there's 350 species of dog that come from a wolf. Uh, you, you know, you just get people with the same characteristics and you're going to breed that characteristic, you know, um, and, and color is simply the product of the pr body's production of melanin, which is there to protect the body from the harmful radiation of the sun. Now, in Kent Hovind and Carl Baugh and a lot of creation scientists, they, in their creation model, and I agree with this, that the pre-flood world had a canopy surrounding the earth that would have filtered the harmful radiation of the sun. So melanin is, it has a lot of other functions besides just skin color, but um, that's one of its functions is to protect the skin from harmful radiation. Well, if there is no harmful radiation, you're not going to have anybody with dark colored skin. We get dark skin, you know, white guys like me with my Scottish pale skin goes out and either gets burnt really fast or gets a gradual tan, depending on how much time I spend out there, because my body starts saying, hey, I got to protect it from the harmful radiation. So I'm going to produce more melanin. That's why we tan. Um, and, and that can happen. Uh, there are certain foods that will actually produce melanin for you that happen to grow in equatorial regions. Well, uh, Dr. Ken Johnson pointed something out to me regarding Kush. Who, black people don't descend from ham directly. They, they, just, they do because ham is the father of Kush. But Kush is the first black man. And that's what his name means, black. Um, that's why the hold, Kushites are hold, Ethiopian. Hold that thought. We're up against a hard break. When we come back, boy, last segment of the Freedom Link, and what a jam-packed episode of the Freedom Link this is, folks. Don't go away. Much more to come. Don't forget, support True Frequency Radio. Get that subscription today. We'll be right back. Man, I'm just speechless. This is London calling on Long Wave. The Chris Everard Show. Sundays on True Frequency Radio. Welcome back, everybody. Last, and it's sad to say, last segment of the Freedom Link tonight is my special guest, Rob Skiba. His website, kingsgatemedia.com, kingsgatemedia.com. And, man, I'll tell you, we're, we're into this, uh, Rob, uh, talking about where um, skin color and uh, characteristics came from and yeah. the lineage. I mean, this is fascinating stuff. Yeah, I started to, to mention earlier, Dr. Ken Johnson had pointed me to something a while back. And it was a, it was an Egyptian hieroglyph that showed two that looked two people that looked like they were white people. Uh, but one of them was pregnant. One was probably a, a nursemaid or something. And they're showing this person in various stages of their pregnancy while the nursemaid is taking certain types of berries and mixing them together and feeding them to the pregnant person. And the last depiction showed the, uh, the, the pregnant woman had given birth the white preg pregnant woman had given birth to a black child. And when I first heard of that, I started looking up. People can look this up for themselves, too. Melanin producing fruits and vegetables. That there are, and if people want to have darker skin, uh, you know, it's carrots will do it, but you're going to turn orange. <laughs> you're going to turn more oranges. But <laughs> there are certain foods that will, in fact, in fact, I, I was talking with somebody this weekend that knew somebody who uh, really took this to a, 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 a limit of testing and actually changed their eye color. Um, as a result of, of just eating certain foods that had the, because, uh, you know, it's the pigment that melanin uh, causes, the, right. you know, the change in your pigment. So, um, you know, uh, and it just makes sense. If, if your people are settling on the equatorial regions that God in his sovereignty and love and mercy and grace would put foods there that would naturally cause the body to increase its production of melanin so that you can survive. Uh, you know, you put a, a Scotsman on the equatorial region and they're going to have a big problem, you know? Um, sure. And, you, and conversely, if you take a, an African and put them up, uh, in the Northern plains of Siberia, <laughs> uh, they're going to have a problem. Sure. You know, because their bodies metabolize fat differently. You know, this is not evolution. This is adaptation that God put within us. Like the Eskimo has a way of metabolizing food differently than somebody that lives in the equator. 
God did that. He, he put that into us so that we could survive in the various places. So, you know, I, I, I just want to put that out there right now to demystify color, for, first of all. I mean, right. it's, it, it's not as complicated as people want to make it. And facial features and things like that. Okay, Tower of Babel. Oh, this is a, this is an awesome. But I, I I really want to get into this and and Nimrod because yeah yeah n- boy Nimrod was just so pivotal and totally train wrecking our the the human race. Oh, yeah, for sure. And and I I would say this when I mentioned earlier the two things that differentiate the days of Noah from any other time of human history are two things. One hybridization, whether you're talking angel human or animal human, we've already talked about that. The other thing is on the 350 years after the flood is the creation of interdimensional portals. What is that? Well, the Tower of Babel, for one thing. The Tower of Babel was created to reach into heaven. You know, that's what you read in Genesis 11. Well, right. it's not about height. Look, God didn't freak out when we built the, built the World Trade Centers. Or right, the, so it's know, not Sears like the Tower. second coming of the Freedom Tower or anything like that. No, the, yeah. he, God's not, he doesn't care about height. That's not, not the issue. And, and they didn't care about height either. If your goal is to build a tall structure to reach into heaven, well, you start on the tallest mountain you can find. You don't build it in the plains of Shinar. <laughs> you, you don't, you don't good, build it in a valley. Good you point. Uh, hello, McFly. I mean, it's, duh. <laughs> um, no, it was an interdimensional portal. In fact, uh, Joshua goes into a lot of detail uh, regarding the Tower of Babel, and the Sumerian texts do as well. Uh, en- Enmerkur, who was, I believe was a Sumerian name for Nimrod, um, was building one of these structures. And uh, we, we could think of it like this way, like a, a stargate, okay? Um, an interdimensional portal at the top of what I believe is a ziggurat structure um, that they may bridge this world with that of the spiritual realm. And uh, Joshua said that, Eden, that Noah, uh, excuse me, Nimrod had divided the people up into three different groups. And one group's goal was to, when they bridge the veil, when they create the Stargate portal, was to go in there and assault the angels. The next group was to go in there and take the throne room and kill God. And the third group was to go in and set up their own gods with Nimrod as king uh, of the heavens and earth. Well, what's intriguing to me about the story is that God looks down at what's going on, and he says something rather interesting. He says, now whatever they imagined to do would not be restrained from them, which means it was theoretically possible. Right. Not that, not that they could kill God. I don't believe they could kill God, but it was theoretically possible that they could have rent a veil, because there is a veil. Uh, you know, we see it in Scripture. Elijah, you know, the, the, he's got his, his buddy there with him, and uh, Elisha, I think, uh, was freaking out. You know, they got their enemies around him. He's like, you don't see what I see. Lord, open up his eyes. Boom. You know, the veil is removed, and he sees the heavenly host all around him. Like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, there, there is a realm just beyond our senses. And uh, we, just like in the days of Noah, are creating interdimensional portals with CERN, and other uh, hedron colliders and things of that yeah, nature. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You know how many people yeah. poo-poo that and say, oh, no, well, the science doesn't support that. That's no way these spirals showing up in the sky have anything to do with that, no. Oh, yeah, come and, on, and the I, Norway I, spiral, hello. Yeah, and then I have to ask, I, I ask the question very simply to everybody, and I always get the deer-in-the-headlight looks. Uh, c- can you please name me um, one thing that the government has told you that is true? Oops, yeah. 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 You know, well, it's interesting to me that they had this technology uh, almost 3000 B.C. Yeah. And and this this flies in the face of evolutionary or even theistic evolutionary thinking, because evolutionary thinking says the further back you go, the dumber everybody is. And, you know, the more primitive when it's the exact opposite. We are only now beginning to catch up to what was going on in the pre-flood world and, and shortly afterwards. But but this was a brilliant strategy of God. Uh, you know, if you think of Atlantis style uh, technology and understanding, wisdom, knowledge, um, what better way to mess it all up than to get everybody so they can't understand each other? Oh, so, right. You know, and and uh, there's really good biblical reason as well as extra biblical reason to um, say that, that God confounded the languages into 70 different languages that's seven zero folks seven zero seven zero seven zero and it, and it, it's not just languages it's people groups it's the nations um there's 70 different people groups 70 different languages and there's probably to the best of my 
estimates about a thousand people on the planet at the time of the Tower of Babel, which is only 100 to 150 years after the flood. So, um, you know, it's not too, too, you know, you got eight people to get off the ark and then, you know, 150 years later, I think you got about maybe at the high side, a thousand people. What a number is, they split up into 70 different people groups. Now imagine you, you know, you're in a group with Einstein. Okay, cool. You know, your buddy over here is in the group with Pee Wee Herman. So, I mean, <laughs> you're screwed. You know what I mean? I mean, what, what's the collective wisdom of that group? You know, um, so you can see how, you know, some some societies, some cultures develop maybe quicker. And that's why we have like the Sumerians. I believe Nimrod, you know, whoever went with his group, they had the benefit of his knowledge, you know. Right. Uh, and so he settles Sumeria. But he becomes known by many other names. Why? Because everybody went away from the tower talking about the same guy now in a different language. So, you know, same guy becomes known as Enmerker or Gilgamesh or Apollo or Cyrus or, you know, Orion. Uh, you know, any Ninurta, a whole bunch of different names. Uh, I refer to him as the man of many names because that's exactly what he is. Uh, and and I try to tie at least some of the major um, uh, stories together, showing that they're all pointing and talking about the same guy. And I credit Tom Horn for pointing me in that direction, as well as Peter Goodgame. These are two other researchers who really got me going in that direction. Peter Goodgame's got a book called The Giza Discovery that's online for free. Just Google Giza Discovery by Peter Goodgame. Fascinating, fascinating read. Uh, it's what really launched me into a lot of my research. Um, and, but I also want to demystify something here, and that's gigantism. Now, for whatever reason, we can think, well, you know, angel mates with humans, sure, giants, that just makes sense. Well, in my thesis, that happened 1,200 years before the flood and has not happened since. Mm -hmm. God, God dealt with the root cause, and it's never happened again. Um, the symptom had to be dealt with later, uh, and he did so for the purpose of Joshua chapter 2. If you read Joshua chapter 2, Rahab uh, gives a testimony. Man, we are all terrified of you guys. We heard what you guys did to the Egyptians and what your God did and what you did to Og of Bashan and Sihon and the Amorites. Woo, man, we're all terrified of you and your God. Well, that's the purpose. <laughs> I mean, either way, you've got to reckon with the fact that God allowed Nephilim to, to be after the flood, whether you believe in multiple incursions or not. We all have the same problem to deal with. There are giants after the flood. Oh, um, absolutely. But in my scenario, the root cause is dealt, dealt with. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to put an external Band-Aid on an internal tumor. You haven't dealt with the problem. If you, if you believe in multiple incursions, then you've put an external Band-Aid on an internal tumor. <laughs> uh, and you basically, you have God wiping the whole world out and leaving eight helpless people, four helpless women to the whims of countless fallen angels. Here you go, guys. Pick up where you left off. Have yeah. fun. And, and that, Bye -bye. Yeah. That just probably won't end well. You know, that's no, that's not, not good. cool. And that's not my God. My God's not like that. He, uh, he, he dealt with the root problem. The root cause is over and done with. And the symptoms, he allowed his people to deal with the symptoms for, for two reasons, to show himself great and to show them great through him, you know, him working through them. Um, but let me demystify gigantism. Sure. You mentioned Liger at the top of the broadcast. Oh, yeah, that was fascinating when I saw that on your presentation. It, dude, it blew me away. When I, when you, people can go to the website LigerLiger.com. That's the primary website for the Ligers, LigerLiger.com. And uh, you'll see that they took – it's called a Liger. Uh-oh. Tygon, Tygons. Oh, what is it called? No, I, you, you just broke up again, so if you could just start from um, – oh. The Liger.com and then go into what it was all about. Go ahead. Yeah, LigerLiger.com is like the official website of the Liger. It's called a Liger because it's a male lion and a female tiger. Unreal. Now, if, you take, if you take a male tiger and a female lion, you get a Ligon. The Ligons are not giants. The Ligers, on the other hand, are. They keep growing until they die. Why? Well, they determine that it is the uh, female lion that has the growth inhibitor gene that tells the lion when to stop growing. Female lion, and it's in the male tiger. So when you switch it and you get a male lion with a female tiger, neither one have the growth inhibitor gene. So you, you, they mate together and they produce an offspring that doesn't have – all it is, an, is an on and off switch, guys. They don't have the on and off switch that says, hey, stop growing at a certain age. Right. My, my on and off switch growth inhibitor gene kicked in at about 16 years of age and said, Rob Skiba, stop growing at five foot 11 inches tall. 
you've got one that told your body when to stop growing at the age, whatever you stop growing. But if you turn that switch off or remove it, well, then you just keep growing. And I just demystify gigantism with a, with a empirical scientific fact that is observable with the Liger. And, and I would also say repeatable. Yeah, repeatable. Absolutely. Yeah, it's repeatable. It's observable. Man, that's a scientific method. What do you know? And that could happen today so with, with what we know at the human genome. Uh, they could just as easily genetically engineer a baby or a fetus or what have you to uh, n- not have the growth inhibitor gene turn on. And if they do that, that kid's just going to become a giant. And, um, you know, that's the way it is. So, and, and, and this is a different type of gigantism from, you know, Robert Wadlow and some of these other guys, you know, th- that we know of in history. Right. Um, he had a, uh, was it pituitary gland or whatever? It was a glandular problem. But people of, of modern times have the, the disorder that he had generally are frail, uh, usually have a lot of health problems and don't live very long. Whereas the giants of the Bible are, you know, strong and warriors and, you know, they live to long ages and, you know, very powerful, strong as the oaks. So, you know, we're not talking about glandular uh, disorders. We're talking about not having a a gene that said stop growing, (laughs) you know. Yeah. And but there's there's also uh, prophetic scriptures like Isaiah chapter 13. And you can read this in the King James and sort of get it. But I would. I would encourage your listeners to go look up uh, the Septuagint online, the English version of the the Greek Septuagint, and read Isaiah 13. Because Isaiah 13 in the Septuagint talks about a a world leader of some sort standing at a place in Babylon in front of a portal, a gate, if you will. Uh And it says, speak to the gate, ye ruler. Giants are coming to fulfill my wrath. It appears from Isaiah 13, that somebody opens up a portal and di- giants come from elsewhere, I would say probably Hades, uh, and enter this realm. And it also talks about satyrs, goat humans, uh, in Babylon, and monsters in Babylon in the last days. Wow, and, isn't that interesting? Now, it's, It gets real interesting, especially if you think of the Gog and Magog War. Standard eschatological models, you know, last days people that study last days, will say Gog and Magog is Russia and China. And they get all wigged out about the 200 million man army because China said they could feel the 200 million man. Uh-huh. It's not Russia and it's not China. I talked about Gog and Magog earlier, the ramparts of Magog, China. Right. Um, Gog and Magog are giants. Every year to this day, since uh, uh, King John Lackland started it, the Lord Mayor Parade is every year in the UK. Uh, they march these two huge statues through the streets of the UK called Gog and Magog because they are giants. Well, I mean, if history and even current events with this parade are telling you that Gog and Magog are giants, and all of a sudden the Ezekiel 38 war takes a way different significance than Russia and China. Uh, we're talking about giants. <laughs> all right. Now, and, and you brought up Babylon and, um, and Isaiah 13, and I'm, I'm of the, uh, the belief, at least uh, based on my biblical research, that you know, <clears throat> we live in modern-day Babylon right now. I think the United States is about as Babylon as it gets. Mm-hmm. And um, it, isn't it interesting that on top of Mount Graham, which yeah, just— Lucifer. W- yeah, the Lucifer telescope, the Roman Catholic Church decides, well, you know what, Mount Graham looks like a great place to go uh, set up the largest <laughs> telescope on the face of the Earth. So let me—more yeah, powerful than even the Hubble Space Telescope. And let's uh, name it Lucifer. <laughs> and let's name it Lucifer. But according to the Apache Indians— it's a, one of four stargates. Yeah, it's a that, portal. It's a portal. So, I I, well, I okay. So when you say, you know, <laughs> portals, Babylon, and I look at the Roman Catholic Church, Arizona, Lucifer Telescope, uh, wow. You know, it's it's like, you go, hmm. gosh, man, I mean, this is, this is crazy <laughs> stuff. And it's, by, by the way, I want to throw this out there, too. Uh, Kev Baker just... Uh, just sent me a little message and said, hey, by the way, Gog and Magog are the patrons of the city of London. Yeah, I know. I know it. I know, I know it's why, crazy. That's why they, and look, all of our presidents, okay, I'm going to get on a soapbox here. If you're a Christian, you, your votes don't matter, people. Your votes don't mean a thing. All of our presidents, all 44 of them are related not only to each other, but they're all related to King John Lackland, the signer of the Magna Carta, who's the guy who created the Lord Mayor Parade honoring Gog and Magog. Now, what would the statistical odds be if we supposedly have presidents of the people, for the people, by the people, like we were taught? Yeah. 
that all 44 of them would be related to each other, including Obama. He's related to both Dick Cheney and George Bush. Isn't that weird? Yeah, it's more than weird. It's nepotism. It's a plan. It, it, it's, it's one big facade that we all play this game every year, thinking our votes actually matter, when in fact all we're doing is signing our, our signature as an endorsement for Luciferians. Uh, and this is coming from a guy, look, I used to be very politically active, you know, uh, contributing to people, voted for George W. twice, thinking he was the, it, you know. Now I'm like, oh, my gosh, this guy is about as Luciferian as it come. Um, but would you re- say, let me ask you this, would you say that it's almost a supernatural kind of nepotism? And in, in, because it is. How, do humans, how do humans pull this off? You know what I mean? It's a bloodline. It, they are preserving a bloodline that actually goes all the way back to Nimrod. And it goes back to the Babylonian mystery schools, which is why, and the Egyptian mystery, mystery schools, Osiris, which is why all these guys are not only related to each other, but they're also part of secret societies. Ah. Skull and Bones, Freemasons, Rosicrucians, you know, you name it. Uh, they all have affiliations with secret societies. And all the secret societies have rituals that trace directly back to Osiris Nimrod. Wow. So, uh, you know, at that point, you, you wake up and you realize, and look, I tell people all the time, I'll say it right now, don't believe a thing I say. <laughs> don't believe a <laughs> thing I say. Everything I've said for the last hour and a half plus, don't believe me. Go look it up for yourself, because if I tell you I'm just some crazy crackpot, but if you look it up for yourself and you discover it for yourself, you're going to go, oh, my God, he's right. Everything I was taught was a lie. <laughs> oh, no, you're, you're right. I mean, we find that so many times, and that's one of the things that we pride ourselves on is that, you know, hey, no problem. Just go look it up for yourself because the truth is the truth. No matter, no matter if you want to accept it as the truth or not, that's not going to change it. You know, right. just because it is what it is, it is what it is. I mean, it's unbelievable. And Nimrod, you know, um, one of the things I learned about Nimrod, the funny thing is like, for example, all the pagan holidays that yeah. everybody does Christmas you know, and Easter. One of my favorite, one of my favorite times of year. And I know it's kind of sick and I'm, I'm sorry, folks, you know this because I've said it in the past, but um, I call it the running of the sheeple or Black Friday because uh, uh, be, yeah. be, because it's, it, to me it's like, uh, you know, I, we have the running of the sheeple. Like who's going to get trampled today? Who's going to yeah. fight over a $5 toaster? But really we have uh, – the society today has devolved to that. I mean it's savage. Oh, you know, you have Thanksgiving where you're thankful for everything you have. And then you go the next day and kill each other for tickle me Elmo. How does that make sense? <laughs> tickle me Elmo. I know. Oh gosh. Right. No, you're I mean, absolutely right. I, I, I might say with you, Rob, I'm telling you, it's, it's unbelievable. Well, you know, the Christmas and Easter thing that was hard for me too. Cause I have very fond memories of, me too. I mean, Christmas has always been a great time in my family growing up and you know, the Christmas tree, I used to love laying under the Christmas tree, looking at the sure. lights, dancing on the ceiling, the smell, all that stuff, man. My, my wife still grieves that. I mean, to this day, cause this oh, is, yeah. this is the, this will be the second, um, the second Christmas coming up where, where we don't do it. And Good boy, did we, we catch hell. I mean, we caught total hell from yeah. both, both sides of the family because it's what you make of it, Rob. Yeah, well, it's not true. It's it's what it is. <laughs> um, I mean, we, you know, the call of the last days is to come out of Babylon, my people. Why? So you do not partake of her plagues. It's conditional. If you choose to stay in Babylon, well, guess what? You're going to get the wrath that's poured out on Babylon. It's that's not right. meant for you. But, you know, if you decide to stay there, he's told you to get out. But if come you want to get out, out people. Yeah. yeah. And for me, I wrote my book, Babylon Rising. And I, the, the, what I thought was the last chapter where I was talking about our troops coming out of Babylon, Iraq. And I thought, okay, I'm done. And, you know, God basically said, no, you're not. You got to come out of Babylon too. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not in Babylon, Lord. <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> and he started to reveal to me just how many practices and rituals and traditions and things that we do in the standard Christian, you know, environment that is directly related to Nimrod. And, uh, you know, it grieved my heart. It really did. uh, When I realized, I mean, look, people have to go do their own journey, do their own research, but it is a fact. Christmas and Easter have absolutely nothing to do with the Savior you say you believe in. Now, you've been to Israel, right? And and I've been to the Middle East. Uh, I did um, two tours in Iraq, and I uh, I was also in, uh, in Bosnia for a while. And I'll tell you what, if you go over there and you ask them what Easter is, they'll tell you what Easter is. They know yeah. what Easter is, and it has nothing to do no. with uh, the the, uh, the resurrection of the Messiah. Nothing. You know? Not it's at all. It's the same thing. Same thing. I mean, uh, and people in the occult and Wicca and, you know, Druids and whatnot, they mock us. They know 
the, you know, and people who come out of that and become Christians, they're shocked to see how much is going on in the church that's identical to what they just came out of. And, oh, absolutely. And it, it was sobering for me. And look, I'll just tell people, look, do the research. Yes, tradition sometimes can be hard to let go of. But for me, it wasn't all that hard. It's like, OK, once I knew the truth, there was no going back. Right. Because, see, my love of God, my love of Yahweh trumps religious talking note. It does. Yeah, that's at, right. That, that's really at, at the at the end of the day, you know, tradition, while I have a lot of uh, fond memories and a lot of good family gatherings and all that kind of stuff, it has to I cannot continue to participate because my love for God and for Yeshua trumps all that stuff. That's and right. you have to ask yourself, what are we living this life for? Are we living this life for did we come from a po- a puddle of slime to become human beings just to die off into nothingness or are we living this life for something better Amen. you know and yeah. that's 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 really what it's all about for me and that's why we had to make that hard decision when it comes to dealing with our families but for us in our hearts you know my family it's it's a relatively easy one to make yeah absolutely and as i dove in and saw wait a minute Everybody thinks they're the feasts of the Jews, but that's not what Leviticus 23 says. It says these are the feasts of Yahweh. These are the feasts of Yahuwah, Yohei Vavhe. Right. Um, it, they're his, and he's got seven of them, eight if you count the Sabbath. So I'm going, wait a minute, this is kind of a good deal. Yeah, you get if more. I trade, cre- you if get I more. trade two pagan holidays, I'm going to get eight that are all directly related to and, and are foreshadows and tell everything about my Savior. That's an easy that's an easy switch and you know we've been doing it for a couple of years. It's a blast, man. Sukkot is a lot of fun. It's it got it's a commandment. Ha, here's you want to get legalistic? It says have fun. Okay, let's get legalistic. Take a week off, go camping with your family, have fun. Use your tithe money to do it and bring strong drink if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't get any better than that. There uh, yeah, right? I mean, come on. Uh you, you trade two, you get eight. It's a pretty good deal, and Absolutely. and you're getting out of Babylon at the same time. I'm thoroughly convinced that we're at the end of the show here, but uh, maybe we'll have to do another one just on Nimrod. Oh yeah, I'm thoroughly convinced that he's the Antichrist of of Revelation. Um, oh, we definitely need to get into that. That's a that's a whole show right there. Okay, so we got about a minute and thirty left. Hmm. Uh, can you plug your website and uh, anything else you want to put out? Any uh, upcoming sure. speaking engagements you got? Yeah, uh, I'm speaking in Austin on uh, 25th and 26th. Uh, people can go to the uh, backtothefutureconference.com is the website for that. Uh, backtothefutureconference.com is the next one I'm doing. Uh, BabylonRisingBooks.com and KingsgateMedia.com are the same website. If you go to that website, you'll see a link at the top that says blog. You can click the blog link, and there is about a 1,000 pages worth of content up there right now uh, for free. People can read up on all this stuff. And um, uh, my web, my uh, radio show is on blogtalkradio.com forward slash revolutionary radio. And so you can listen to that. And the TV series that I'm working on, I'm actually doing them as audio dramas right now, is uh, seedtheseries.com. So they can check all that out. Oh, that's fantastic. Folks, I mean, what an incredible two hours. And this is just scratching the surface as far as Bible truths. And, you know, when you look, take a look at the Sumerian uh, miss the Greek mythology, all that stuff. It all ties together. All ties together. It does. And Rob, thank you so much for coming on uh, on tonight. And man, I got to have you back real soon. This is this is just heavy stuff. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, right on, bro. Folks, stay tuned. Down the rabbit hole with Popeye coming up next, and I'll be with you again tomorrow night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Have a great night, everybody. God bless. <laughs>